the joys of uh, uh, virtual <laughs> virtual conferencing. Well, hello everyone. A very warm welcome uh, to this all school seminar from the School of, of Geography and the Environment at the University of Oxford. Uh, my name is Gillian Rose. I'm the uh, head of school. Uh, and I'm really, really delighted to be uh, chairing this event. Um, I'd like to extend a, a big thank you to uh, Dr. Leo Hirsch for, for agreeing uh, to come today and to talk to us. Um, Leoba will be introduced properly by uh, my colleague, Dr. Amber Murray, uh, in, in just a moment. Um, and uh, we also have a panelist, uh, Professor Patricia Daly, who uh, I guess is, is uh, having to join us uh, through a slightly different, uh, different channel. I'm sure that will happen uh, in due course. Uh, but right now, I'm going to hand over to Dr. Sneha Krishnan, uh, who's organised this event along with, uh, with Amber. So over to you, Sneha. Thanks. Thank you very much for that, Gillian. Um, and thank you so much to Leoba for having agreed to give us this talk today. Um, this talk has been organized by the Political Worlds Research Cluster at the School of Geography, which I coordinate with Dr. Amber Murray. This cluster asks how politics and power are constituted in and across space and place. We seek to develop no novel and critical understandings of the relationships between geographical knowledges and regimes of discipline and violence. Cluster members pursue theoretically informed research that tackles these questions through a range of scales from the body to the global and from the household to the nation state. While diverse, our work converges around four sets of questions. We look at life, death and well-being, violence, non-violence and disciplining, politics, power and geopolitics and geographical knowledges. Leo Bahersh's talk today, which will take a historical and ethnographic approach to looking at black geographies of mobility, sits at the intersection of many of these concerns. My colleague, Dr. Amber Murray, will introduce Dr. Hirsch's work and this talk. Thanks, Neha. Um, it's really an honor to welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us, and especially thank you um, to Leoba for uh, sharing your time with us this afternoon. Dr. Leoba Hirsch is a qualitative and archival researcher with an interest in the colonial and anti-Black entanglements of Western biomedicine and global health management. Their research has focused on the historical development, contemporary management, and colonial aftermath of British health interventions in West Africa. Dr. Hirsch's PhD thesis analyzed the British-led international Ebola response in Sierra Leone in the wake of British colonialism and the transatlantic slave trade. Dr. Hirsch has a BA in political sciences from Sciences Po Paris and an MSc in political sociology from the London School of Economics. After completing their MSc, they joined the field of international development, working for the German government's International Development Agency in Zambia. They have a PhD from UCL's Department of Geography and Institute for Global Health. And Dr. Hirsch is currently a research fellow at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. They have published widely on topics around the politics of research and ethnography, medical emergencies and black geographies, decolonizing global health, and the intersections between colonial institutions and health geographies. We thank you very much for joining us. And with that, I will turn over to Leoba. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, you made me sound really great there. <laughs> Um, let me just um, try and share my screen. Um, and I apologize in advance. I just got another um, message from Zoom that my internet connection is unstable. And I really hope that that's not going to interrupt my talk. All right. I hope you can all see this um, and hear me. Um, thank you so much for having me. Um, it's um, a great pleasure to be here. Um, I thought I would start by sharing some gratitude and some acknowledgements. Um, I wanted to start by thanking Amber and Sneha for organizing um, the session and for inviting me. Um, I'm very grateful. Um, thank you to um, Julian Rose for chairing the session and to Professor Patricia Daly for um, agreeing to be the discussant. Um, I feel very honored. Um, I also always think it's good to restate that knowledge is obviously never produced by any one individual. So while I'm very 
flattered and, and, and happy that you invited me. It's really important to acknowledge that um, I learned from, from and, and, and I guess my research and, and, and knowledge production are in conversation with um, people whose work I read, but also with, um, with friends and, 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 and family and colleagues and students who, I, who I'm in, in conversation with. Um, I especially learn a lot from queer, trans, ind indigenous and people of colour and unfortunately they continue to be underrepresented in, in academia in, in the UK and globally and also still unfortunately in geography. So what I've started doing is um, whenever I'm invited to speak somewhere I just want to sort of give a shout out or, or point people in the direction of of a couple of scholars who I think produce really important um, and, and, um, and interesting work. And so today, um, I thought I'd, um, I'd flag the work of Lo Marshall, um, the a PhD researcher at, um, at, uh, UC, at the UCL Department of Geography, and they work on queer geographies um, and, and queer urban nightlifes, and they produce really, really great work. And the second person is um, Victoria Okoye, who's also um, a PhD researcher at the University of Sheffield, and they work on, um, on anti-blackness and coloniality in urban planning and architecture in Accra and Ghana. So I encourage you to either give them a follow, I've put, I've put their, their Twitter handles here, or to Google them or add them to, to your reading lists or, or engage with their work, uh, however you see fit. Finally, thank you so much for creating the space for me and for my thoughts. Um, I do really appreciate it. I think if we want to work to turn geography from, from a quite white and, and still very colonial discipline into something that's more diverse and inclusive. We need to create more spaces like this. But I think if we want to do that sustainably, it's also really, really important that we give scholars of color and marginalized scholars the financial security of long-term and permanent appointments. So I would encourage you the next time you, um, you want to make an appointment to keep that in mind um, and, and, and potentially hire um, a researcher or a scholar of color or someone from the global south. That's my political bit done. Um, what I want to do today is um, sort of take three snapshots um, that come from my PhD research, but also from reflections that have sort of come up during the Ebola, uh, sorry, during the COVID pandemic, confusing pandemics at this point, um, and, and, and look at, um, at, at how the themes of health, mobilities, and diasporic blackness sort of interact with one another in these three snapshots. And um, in order to do this, I, I, I obviously build on, on work um, by black scholars, um, such as Christina Sharp, Hortense Spiller, or Nobise Philip, who in really eloquent and, and, and sophisticated ways analyze and write about how transatlantic journeys transform black ontology. So how they transform black, the ways in which we conceptualize blackness, think about blackness or, 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 or understand blackness. And that's really what this idea of Black ontologies is about, how we theorize and understand and conceptualize Black existence and, and, and identity in the modern world. Um, I also um, built on work done by Cameroonian scholar Ashin Bembe. Um, he's, a, he's a political philosopher who's written widely about um, post-colonialism and, and Blackness. And obviously, because I'm talking about mobilities, I'm also drawing on, uh, on Mimi Scheller, whose, whose work I think is fantastic. And so I'm doing all of this to, to really get to what I think is, is a really central question in how we think about Blackness, and that's how mobilities contribute to our understanding um, and, and, and our conceptualization of Blackness today. Um, so what I'll do is I'll use three different health-related examples to analyze how mobilities shape how we think about Blackness. In the first example, I look at post-colonial and colonial mobilities and how they shape Blackness as dependence. In the second snapshot, I look at urban Blackness being moved both emotionally but also geographically and self-policing deviance, so Blackness as deviance, the creation of the mobile creation of Blackness as deviance. And in the final example, I look at transatlantic mobilities, um, COVID-19 and disease and, 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 and genetic Blackness, or how Blackness is construed as biologically different from whiteness. Um, a few things about blackness. Um, I'm sort of throwing that word around a lot, but obviously blackness is not a mon monolith and black people aren't a monolith. And I think that's really important to bear in mind. Uh, when I talk about blackness, I mostly speak about um, people of African descent, but I'm aware that that's not the only valid or the only definition of blackness that there is. It's just how I use it in my work. 
Um, it's important to remember that race is a social construct. It's not real, although the consequences of its invention very much are. So while race isn't real, um, racism very much is. Um, and conceptualizations of blackness can be both internal and external. And that's something that, that um, I'll point to in, in the different snapshots that I present here. And it's also something that um, Ashin Bembe talks about quite a lot in his book, um, Critique of Black Reason. And he writes, for white Europeans and their descendants, the function of blackness was first and foremost to codify the conditions for the appearance and the manifestation of a racial subject that would be called the black man in the original French, Le Negre, and later within colonialism, the native, Landigen. So what he does is he sort of takes black studies, conceptualizations of blackness, which are mostly focused on the Americas and post-colonial studies, and he brings them together to explain how a modern racial subject, a black modern racial subject is created. And these conceptualizations of blackness, both the white Western one, but also the, the black African one, um, are really tightly bound up with anti-black regimes and anti-black regimes um, um, are for instance, colonialism or, or the slave trade. All right, so um, in the first snapshot, uh, and this uh, is from my PhD, um, I'd like to look at the Sierra Leonean diaspora Ebola mobilities at the colonial past. And so what we have here is two maps. The one on the left shows direct flight connections linking Freetown to cities and countries in West Africa and in Europe. And this is before the beginning of the Ebola um, epidemic in 2014. And the map on the right um, shows direct flight connections out of Freetown at the height of the Ebola epidemic. So between around April, May 2014 and August 2016. And as you can see, um, during the Ebola epidemic, um, Sierra Leone is effectively cut off largely from, from the rest of the world, at least in terms of aero mobilities. And this, this disruption of flight connections, and especially the suspension of a direct flight connection between Freetown and London, came up a lot in interviews that I conducted with members of the Sierra Leonean diaspora in the UK, but also with British-based um, um, health um, health workers who volunteered um, during the Ebola epidemic in Sierra Leone. And so both were equally involved in, in, in the epidemic, but what emerged was that uh, Black Sierra Leonean members of Leova, can you hear me? Uh, the video has stopped on my end. Yeah, it stopped for me too. We might have to um, stop the video. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, so as I was saying, the, the two maps show flight connections um, between Sierra Leone and, um, and the UK. Um, first, before the beginning of the Ebola epidemic in 2014, and then the, the map on the right um, shows flight connections um, linking Freetown to the world um, during, during the Ebola epidemic. And as you can see, um, Freetown at this point and, and Sierra Leone is, is really cut off, at least in terms of aero mobilities. And so the suspension of flights and especially the, the loss of the direct connection between Freetown and London came up a lot in the interviews that I conducted with both with members of the Sierra Leonean diaspora in the UK who were involved in the Ebola response, but also with um, international and British based um, health workers who volunteered in the response as well, both in Sierra Leone and in the UK. Um, and what was really interesting is, was that, that both groups um, made sense of these, of these disruptions and the suspension of, of mobilities in different ways. And so what I want to do here is think through and historicize the different ways in which black and white interview participants made sense of the mobilities linking Sierra Leone and the UK and the suspension. So when the direct flights were suspended in mid-2014, members of the Sierra Leonean diaspora in the UK mounted various advocacy efforts to get them back. And you can see one of the examples here, that's a, just a screenshot from a, from a change.org petition trying to, to get British Airways to reinstate the direct route. And um, I think one of the, the reasons that was brought up quite often, um, both um, in online petitions, but also in, in interviews that I conducted um, for why Sierra Leoneans really wanted this direct route was a shared colonial past. 
Um, and so direct flights between Freetown and London were seen by Sierra Leoneans as a sign of a special relationship linked to colonialism. And I'll give you two examples. Um, one is from 2012, when the then Minister for um, Transport and Aviation was interviewed. And he said, and I quote, London is a preferred route for Sierra Leoneans because of the rich colonial ties between the two countries. And similarly, in this online petition that you can, that you can see here, a lot of people evoke the colonial past and feelings of loss and abandonment at, 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 at the, the lack of this direct route. And one person wrote, I wholeheartedly support this long overdue request for a vital service that is not only financially beneficial to the countries, but also cements the historical bond between our countries and peoples. And so overall, the comments, um, both that were made to me and in the online petition, indicated a sense that Britain owed Sierra Leone or that it should care about Sierra Leone and the ways in which the suspension affected Sierra Leonean lives in the diaspora and at home. And this sense was confirmed um, by a prominent member of the Sierra Leonean community in the UK, who I interviewed, and he said, British Airways have still not resumed flights to Sierra Leone, which to me is kind of a lesson to us Sierra Leoneans. I think we tend to think the British care about us. They don't even know we exist until something like Ebola happens. And so these were mobilities linking Freetown and London were really seen as symbolizing an emotional connection between UK and Sierra Leone, and that emotional connection was rooted in colonialism. And I think one of the reasons why, why, why the suspension of flights came up so much in interviews was because it enabled members of the Sierra Leonean diaspora in the UK to access Sierra Leonean markets, to visit families and live transnational lives. Um, and uh, one person who, who spoke to this was, was, was um, a, a Sierra Leonean British woman who I interviewed, and she said, BA, so British Airways, was so good for me. Straight direct flight, straight into Lungi, which is Freetown's airport. Crossover, easy. So that was out. Even up to now, BA is not flying there. And that affects loads of businesses. Because when BA was flying, people were going in and out, making deals, staying a couple of days, coming back. It was about six and a half hours and you're there. So that affected just kind of the infrastructure to do business in Sierra Leone. And again, her feelings were echoed in comments to the petition. And one person wrote, I'm signing this petition because BA is missing a great economic opportunity in West Africa. The UK is Sierra Leone's most important market and Sierra Leone is full of opportunity for UK businesses, especially in travel and tourism. So for, um, for, for um, black British Sierra Leoneans, um, these mobilities were really important because they construed Sierra Leone as a place of, of, of economic opportunity, but also allowed them to stay in connection with the country that they had left or that their parents had left. And for white British respondents, this was totally different. They mostly perceived the disruption of the direct route in terms of its effects on the Ebola response. And so one doctor who I spoke to said, so there, there wasn't much option in terms of flights. I flew with whoever was flying on the day I needed to fly. I went from Heathrow, and I think I went via Brussels, although I didn't disembark. The flight was quite interesting because it wasn't a commercial flight. Well, it was a commercial flight, but it wasn't a typical commercial flight insofar as that everyone on the flight was going there for a specific reason. So it had a very different feel to it from a normal commercial flight. Another person, another um, um, British um, um, responder to the, to the um, Ebola epidemic in Sierra Leone said, the British government, I think, got a call from the Daily Mail at some point querying why are there still direct flights, so they stopped them immediately. And what we understood at the time is that the health leadership in the UK was strongly pushing to allow direct flights and actually said it would be safer to only have direct flights between the two countries, because then you can monitor who's coming in and out. If everyone is having to change through Brussels or through Casablanca, then you have people going all over Europe and people mixing in all kinds of airports everywhere. Whereas if you've got direct flights, you know what you're doing. But the optics of having direct flights, people coming, people being one flight away from the UK was too great for the government to risk with, to risk going with, sorry. And so really what these two sets of mobi mobilities show is that, that, well, first of all, that there are two sets of, of mobility, so that the ways in which direct routes between uh, Freetown and London were conceived was, were seen as, on the one hand, emergency mobilities, and on the other hand, more quotidian mobilities, and that those differences overlapped with, with I guess, people's racial identities. Um, and um, these, these different sets of mobilities or the different ways in which these mobilities were understood really construed and conceptualized Sierra Leone as two different places. On the one hand, a place in need of humanitarianism and, and humanitarian aid and, and, and charity and foreign intervention. And on the other hand, a place of economic opportunity and, and livelihoods. And so 
whereas predominantly white international health responders described the disruption through its effects on the organization of the response and consequence, consequently construed Sierra Leone as a place in need of foreign intervention, members of the diaspora who were predominantly black construed it as a place of economic opportunity. And this, I think, is very much in line with what Mbembe says about um, Western and Black conceptualizations of Blackness. Um, and importantly, Sierra Leonean conceptualizations of the mobilities connecting Freetown to London differed from white conceptualizations. And Sierra Leoneans were really shocked at how easily Britain gave up on those direct flights and ignored Sierra Leone's potential as an important West African market. But I would argue that um, that um, the conceptualization of Sierra Leone as a place in need of humanitarian aid that was exemplified by white British responders is much more in line in, with how Sierra Leone has been thought of and has been constructed in the British imagination from the beginning. And I'll talk about that a little bit more now. So um, this is, um, again, just a screenshot from a report from the Sierra Leone company, um, its board of directors from 1791. And I feel like looking at this report, and I'll, and I'll, I'll read an excerpt from it in a minute, um, we see that, um, that rather than representing a disruption of long-standing expressions of care, history shows that mobilities linking Sierra Leone and the UK have, and maybe this is unsurprising, always been framed as humanitarian mobilities and never as quotidian. And more importantly, that they have always been infused with Western conceptualizations of Blackness as dependent on white people and on Britain as a charitable country. And the way in which Sierra Leone is conceived in this Western slash British imagination has roots in the founding of the colony of Freetown at the end of the 18th century. And so as is quite typical at the time, Freetown colony is founded by a private company, the Sierra Leone company in this case, but in comparison to other companies, Maroon communities were communities of runaway or freed slaves who would live as free black people in their own little communities and as such obviously posed a threat to the logic of, of, of enslavement more generally. And the second threat was this idea of the black urban poor in British cities in London and Liverpool and Bristol, which offended a British and a white sense of propriety. And this really comes out in this, in this director's report. Um, and I'll just read you a quote from this. Um, so it says, about five years since the streets of London swarming with a number of Blacks in the most distressed situation, who had no prospect of subsisting in this country but by depredations on the public or by common charity, the humanity of some respectable gentlemen was excited towards these unhappy objects. So again, we see how Blackness is constructed as, as, as dependence here. They were accordingly collected to the number of about 400, and together with 60 whites, they were sent out at the charge of government to Sierra Leone. And so removing free black people from the UK, in other words, removing the consequences of Britain's imperial politics becomes the very reason for the creation of Sierra Leone as a company. The threat of dependence, but also the threat of deviance that's built into that paragraph and into this description is the reason for removing black people from London and other cities across the empire to Sierra Leone. And I would argue that that logic hasn't changed and we've seen that with the Windrush scandal very much. Um, and I'll speak more about black mobilities in the, and, and how they construe blackness as deviance um, in the next snapshot. All right, um, so this is a snapshot. It's a personal reflection, that um, a short personal reflection that I'll just read to you. Um, it's on being black joy mobilities and the specter of policing. It's early 2020 and Burner Boy is, playing, is being played from a sound system in the back of a white truck parked next to Stonebridge Gardens in Hackney, London. It's being played for us, the people milling about in the park, sunbathing, eating, enjoying time outside. It's hot and this is the fourth month of the government mandated COVID-19 lockdown. We've come outside to eat dinner on a blanket in the park, just to not be in our flat for a while. A black family has gathered for a picnic nearby. The children are dancing to the music, jumping and clapping. Some of their older relatives join them. DJ Divine has come to play music for the park. Between songs, he holds up a Black Lives Matter sign. He says, come and dance. 
masks, but maintain social distance. We all need to stay safe. He says, black men matter, which is true, but I think also slightly odd. Why this exclusion of women, trans and queer people? DJ Divine is giving us an impromptu dance party. For me, it's a break from COVID-19 and black death and the questionable onslaught of white people realizing that racism is still a thing. It's relief. I tear up a little. I'm happy and moved, and I think I only realize now, sitting in this park and watching people dance, all the tension and anxiety I have been holding in my body for the last few months. One more song, and then the police will come and move me along, DJ Divine says to the park after 10 minutes of his set. I can sense they're almost here. I've been moving around the entire day. I'll go to Victoria Park next. This will be the last song. The park claps and cheers for him to play for longer. One more song and then I'll have to leave, he says after the next song. I can sense they're coming. I remember this moment as one of relief and joy and generosity, but also as one in which DJ Divine's repetitive reference to the police's power to move him along shaped my experience of the event. Here was an example of black joy existing within the confines of police authority and determining a black person's urban movements without being physically manifest. Here, the relief I felt and the joy I experienced at listening to a set put on by a black DJ, one who repeatedly stated that our lives matter, was shaped by the possibility of the police coming to arrest or caution him. In the midst of COVID-19, the extraordinariness and the ordinariness of the situation of experiencing and witnessing this twofold iteration of being moved, both emotionally and geographically, ge geographically sorry, while black, gave me pause. DJ Divine's sense of the police's imminent arrival, determined by his experience of being a black man in the UK, I suppose, and his narration thereof, speaks to both a spatial strategy and a geographical reality. Ending his set early to avoid an encounter with the police meant a sense of self-policing, an almost Benthamian strategy of avoiding criminalization by cutting short what he and we enjoyed. Here, black mobility became an expression of a black geographical reality, one in which, as Bledsoe and Wright have argued, we're not meant to shape and take up space, yet also one in which our mobile strategies, often responses to anti-blackness, are too rarely deemed worthy of analysis. This mobile duality and the ways in which it shapes the moment in the park are typical of black modernity. They speak to how black people feel and sense urban landscapes. And Naya Jones writes more about this idea of sensing. In Hackney, these racial and racist complexities intervened in an environment shaped by other factors, such as gentrification. I used to live around the corner, DJ Divine tells us between songs. My mother sold our house a little too early. The park laughs. The context in which this event took place is one in which movement or the absence thereof was a marker of the space in which it occurred. Hackney, an inner city borough in East London, where Stonebridge Gardens are situated, was particularly affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. In early May, at the height of the British epidemic, Hackney's mortality rate was the third highest in the country. A borough with a significant population of African, Caribbean and Asian descent, Hackney's black and brown inhabitants constituted a disproportionate amount of those who died from COVID-19 last summer. Racism, gentrification and the borough's socioeconomic inequalities, all of which played out spatially during the government mandated COVID-19 lockdown, shaped how members of different groups, identities and socioeconomic privileges experienced and lived the, the epidemic. In line with the official government policy until mid-May 2020, the official advice from Black Lives Matter UK, so the organization, was that people should not participate in, in mass gatherings. This meant that a considerable number of people did not participate in BLM protests due to fear of infection or of infecting vulnerable protesters. Listening to DJ Divine's set moved me because he allowed me to participate, to participate in an event that publicly affirmed that Black Lives Matter, to be loud and take up space and do so joyfully. As Nathaniel Tillemach has argued, there's defiance and black joy that is publicly displayed, as well as the tenacity and the will to claim space to be seen and heard and encountered. The knowledge that the set would end because of the invisible threat of policing meant that this moment was always going to be short lived. Black mobilities and emotions circled around each other, amplifying and detracting from one another. Movement and the joy and pain that various forms of movement generate in our lives and deaths the way past mobilities and immobilities have shaped who and where we are and where we're going, how and where we call home and claim space, seem to me to be at the heart of black modernity. 
This moment encapsulated a black mobile ontology which extends beyond physical movement, shapes our reality and the emotions that make it. In this instance, DJ Divine ended his set after 40 minutes and drove away. The police never came. All right, I'm going to move on to my last snapshot. Um, and what I want to do here is just, I guess, deeper, not talk a little bit more about some of the things that, that, that I just evoked in, 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 in the second snapshot um, and talk about COVID-19 mobilities and, and blackness as biological difference or as defective. And so I would argue, and I think we're, we've all become aware of this, that, that COVID-19 really reveals the mobility and justice at the heart of, of, of blackness and of black people and black modernity in the UK. And one way in which this is revealed is that more people are dying from COVID-19 who were born outside the UK in regions such as Sub-Saharan Africa, the Caribbean, uh, Southeast Asia and the Middle East in the UK today than people who were born in the UK. And I think that's something that needs to give us pause. And it really leads me to asking this, what I think is a really, really important, but also very painful question. And that's how do we think through the fact that moving to the UK may have raised black and brown people to risk of COVID-19 deaths? The mobility and justice also plays out on a more local level. And um, it does so in the sense that um, our ability to follow the government's advice that we should all stay at home was really only possible from the beginning for a certain segment of the population namely all of us who were able to do our jobs from home and still get paid. And while it's good that we did that, it's also important to bear in mind that online sales and the gig economy boomed in 2020, and that the furniture that we ordered and the clothes and the food and, 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 and everything was delivered and had to be assembled in, in distribution centers and in Amazon warehouses, and that the people working in those warehouses are disproportionately black and brown. And so we're now in a situation in this pandemic in which post-colonial and enslaved mobilities and immobilities still shape our capacity to survive COVID-19. And I think a, a, a really pertinent example for that is, is this um, article here that was published, I think, last week in The Guardian of yet another outbreak of COVID-19 in, in a migrant detention um, center. Since the beginning of the, uh, of the epidemic in the UK, activist groups have called on the UK government to release people from these detention centers and the government has ignored them. Um, in comparison, at the beginning of the, the Portuguese epidemic, Portugal at least temporarily um, um, gave legal status to all the asylum seekers and all irregular migrants to allow them to seek proper health care and help them manage the epidemic better. And that's something that the UK government could have done, but chose not to. And it's another, um, it's another example of, of how black and brown lives don't matter. Um, at the same time, I think how we think about black and African health is also entangled with mobility. So mobilities don't only shape the ways in which we can react and, and, and survive the pandemic, it also shapes the ways in which we think about black health and African health. And one example of this or how this came out um, was I think um, mid last year when suddenly all of these genetic explanations for, um, for differential mortality rates between black um, and, and, and white British um, citizens um, were circulated online and really became part of the mainstream conversation around COVID-19 and, 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 and racial difference um, 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 for, for a while. Um, and I think what's shocking um, in, in, these, in, in, in the, the space that these hypotheses took up, take up is that race continues to persist as a biological category, um, while the impact of racism is still sidelined and marginalized, and, and, and how it impacts healthcare is still sidelined and marginalized. Um, and the other, the, I guess, the second reason why, why I think this was, was especially shocking was because these genetic hypotheses take us back to 17th, 17th century understandings of blackness and the 20th century understandings of black health that derive from them. Um, and I'd like to um, illustrate that by giving you one last example um, around how um, health and blackness and mobilities all come together. And so this is um, not an example that I've come up with. Um, Angela Saini dis um, discusses, it, discusses it in her book, The Superior. Um, this is an engraving from 1725 um, entitled, An Englishman Tastes the Sweat of an African. Um, and uh, this engraving um, um, suddenly um, took center stage or became really important in, uh, in a medical hypothesis in the US in the 1980s. 
And that was a medical hypothesis around um, hypertension, high blood pressure. Um, and what happened was that um, for years and years, um, scientists in the US and around the world tried to figure out why African Americans have much higher rates of, of, of high blood pressure, of hypertension than white Americans. And um, a Harvard economist, Roland Fryer, came across this engraving, and he came up with the following hypothesis. He argued that slave traders would lick the, the skin or the sweat of, of Africans who were about to be enslaved to test the salt content of their, of their sweat. And the idea was that those Africans who had a higher salt content and, and a higher salt, salt content, sorry, um, speaks to um, a high ability to retain sodium in your body and therefore to retain bodily fluids. Sodium is mostly um, found in bodily fluids that the ability to retain bodily fluids would equip Africans better to survive the transatlantic journeys and the brutal conditions um, that, that, that governed life on, 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 on slave ships, really. And so um, um, Roland Fryer, the economist, um, came up with this idea that the reason why African Americans are now suffering from higher hypertension is because they are descendants of Africans um, with uh, a better ability to, um, to, to contain sodium in their bodies. This hypothesis has been debunked several times, and, but what I think is interesting about it is that its consequences still linger and still shape how we think about black health and black bodies as different. And one example of that is the screenshot, which I took a couple of months ago, I'm pretty sure it's still up there from the NHS. Um, and this is the NHS's um, 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 website on, on or page on, on hypertension, on high blood pressure. And if you look at the very bottom, you see that among the risk groups, pe being of African or Caribbean origin is still seen as, 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 um, as a risk factor. And I think this is really important because while the mobilities that have shaped the prejudice and the, the, um, the I guess, misleading conceptions of blackness that lead to this assumption have sort of been neglected and, and, and are gone and we don't look at them anymore, the results are still very much the case um, as we have seen um, during COVID-19 again. So just to conclude, um, I've shared three snapshots and I don't think these snapshots um, cohere into a unified conceptualization of blackness, and I don't want them to, but I think it's important to restate that. Um, what I hope to have done is um, to have illustrated how mobilities have been entangled and how we understand and perceive blackness, varyingly as dependence, deviance, and biologically different or defective, as in the case of COVID-19. As Michelle has pointed out, racial boundaries are formed, reformed, and transformed through mobile relations of power. And I think that's something that becomes really important and that we need to look at more in, in, in when we look at health mobilities and how blackness is conceived nowadays. Colonial, enslaved, and post-colonial mobilities linking Africa to Europe, governing black urban lives, and shaping our understanding of perceived biological difference illuminate the construction of blackness as a social category, as a lived reality, and as a political identity. Um, and I think we need to pay much closer attention to, to this going forward. Thank you. That's me. I'm going to stop sharing. Thank you so much. That, that was that was brilliant. Um, you, conceptually rich uh, and I'd love to talk to you more about the use of emotion through it as well but I'm really delighted that um, Patricia Daly is joining us as panellist uh, so I'm going to hand over to Patricia uh, for, for some uh, commentary. Um, I'd also encourage members of the audience please do post any questions uh, for Folioba uh, either in the chat or, or in the Q&A um, uh, box on, on, on the Zoom interface. Thanks very much. So uh, over to Patricia. Okay, thank you. I, I sorry about. Sorry about, sorry about, sorry about uh, am I echoing? I'll have to switch off one of these machines. Is that better? So, can you hear me now? Sorry. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm I'm operating on two machines because I couldn't connect. Um, and I wanted to hear your talk. So thank you very much for um, what really it was a very fascinating presentation. And I think that one was that's very timely um, as we think about ways in which we can bring black geographies to the fore 
but and it helps us to think also about the sort of methodologies and the questions we ask when we do research on um, what we would call decolonizing methodologies. But certainly thinking, um, and your work really fits into very well into, into, into that of some of the um, authors you cited at the beginning as having an influence, that of Christine Sharp and others who have written about this precarity that Black people find themselves in. And um, I, you know, I, th I think for perhaps for many people in the audience, what you have this uh, outlined to us um, in a really interesting and fascinating way is probably new in the sense that um, they might not have encountered this uh, material before. But nevertheless, I think one, one of the things about, and certainly within um, black intellectual thought, uh, there has been discussions about the way in which um, colonial uh, our mobilities, particularly um, not just within transnational transatlantic mobilities, but also even within the continent of Africa, have been shaped by racialization. And I think the key element about uh, black people and racialization is that black people are not expected to move. They're expected to stay in place and when they are moved or when um, their the, the, uh, mobility is encouraged it's often one that is sanctioned that is regulated and governed governed intensely and so so that and and even when people move um, independently of these regulations they live uh, within a context of precarity so irrespective of where you are, people might move for a better life as those Sierra Leoneans in London. Um, but as you've shown, um, precarity um, uh, is, is, is ever present. And I think that we could think about that precarity also in a, as a form of violence and dispossession and displacement. And I wonder whether you might want to broaden out to look at the literature on colonial violence and displacement um, and how that impacts psychologically and people, uh, because especially in the sense that um, black people never, you never settle, you're disassociated from the space in which you, you live. Um, and there's that constance and it's not necessarily just in terms of, as I said, um, the transatlantic, transatlantic diasporal experience, but also in relation to people in the continent, on the continent of Africa, people have been moved because of colonial exactions. One of the things I wanted to just pick up on was you mentioned about the flight, the flights in your first example about the flights from London um, being cancelled from London to Brussels. I'm sorry, from London to Sierra Leone. And I was wondering why the Brussels flight continued and when I wondered whether it was to do with ex, the continued nature of extraction, even on the e Ebola, whether it was about diamonds and gold, essentially, because I know, um, you know, uh, Brussels has, has been a center for, uh, for, for, for the movement and, and, and the transformation of, of, of minerals, um, processing of minerals in, in Europe. And during other conflicts in Africa, flights to Brussels <laughs> seem to have continued irrespective of, where, <laughs> of the cancellation of flights elsewhere. So I wondered about that. But also um, the link between Britain and Sierra Leone Right. And um, yes, there is a really strong colonial link there and Sierra Leone's will think that um, will seek to activate that link because that link is real. And I think if you think about uh, uh, um, the discussions about hybridity and about identity and how in some sense, you know, we are still whatever um, we do, we're still connected <laughs> to some form of Britishness, you know, so blackness, especially in, within the colony is really, you know, the co coloniality of our experience continues, it doesn't disappear with, um, you know, flag independence. So, uh, and, uh, you know, but also I think in um, recent history that uh, that coloniality was reinforced by Tony Blair's intervention in the 1990s in the Sierra Leone war. And T Tony Blair 
grew on the tropes of this is our club, you know, this is our place. We built this. We have a responsibility. And I think there was some talk of his time at the time about his father having worked there. Right? Um, but but that connection that was pushed, and Britain was very active in um, in, in uh, well, they would say the resolution of the civil war. Uh, but you know, but there were also West African forces as well in the, in, the, in in Sierra Leone. But yeah, and I think that perhaps resonates more with um, the contemporary. And so at different periods, even when pe uh, you know um, ex colonies uh, or you know, post colonial states seek to break that uh, connection. In fact, it's often reinforced through, um, you, know, uh, you know, various other forms of intervention, whether it's humanitarian, which Blair, that was how Blair um, framed his intervention, the British military intervention um, during the Sierra Leonean War. And finally, um, I suppose I would want to think about, yes, black mobility is, um, is uh, informed and shaped by violence, by precarity, by uh, vulnerability, and so on. But many of the writers also uh, who you've cited think about possibilities of change and transformations and how black people have trans moved in spite of and transgress or seek to assert alternative mobilities. Um, and I, you know, I, I, that's something I've been interested in, actually, um, particularly black mobilities to, Eth to Ethiopia, where we, you know, whether it's back, you know, we might see it as back to Africa, um, but there's a constant stream of return migration to Africa of black um, interventions in different spaces um, or black diaspora intervention in different spaces where black people are, um, are seen as being vulnerable to white supremacy. So yeah, I just wonder, you know, there is a positive element to this. There is a sort of way, way there are ways in which, uh, and, and evidence out there um, of how we think about mobility in very different ways and in a much more, um, I suppose, <laughs> transforming and emancipatory ways than say, um, you know, exists perhaps and, and is understood about how, how it impacts on us. I think that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thanks, Patricia. That, that, that was great. I, I've got a four or five points emerging from that. Leo, would, would you like to respond, um, picking out? What, you know, the, the, yeah. yeah, maybe just briefly. Um, thank you so much, Patricia. Yeah, um, all really, really interesting and, and really good points. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, I think the, the Brussels um, the Brussels Airlines example is, is a really interesting one because um, they actually put up um, posters in Freetown that said we continue to be here for you and that was sort of a further jab at the absence of, of, um, of, of British Airways and, and, and other airlines that had quote unquote abandoned Sierra Leoneans. Um, I don't know about the extraction, it's entirely possible. I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't put it past them. Um, but I think it's a really interesting example because it also came up when I spoke to people. It's not that, I guess it's not that Sierra Leoneans couldn't go to Sierra Leone anymore. It's just that there was no direct flight connection anymore. And that the fact that they had to go through Brussels or to Casablanca really bothered them because it sort of felt like a loss in status, I guess. Um, I think, yeah, also Tony Blair um, is, yeah. I mean, there's so much in the history of Sierra Leone and, and British interventions in Sierra Leone that I think needs to be uncovered and, 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 and questioned and, 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 and needs to be looked at really critically in terms of yeah, post-colonial mobilities and, and, and this idea of, of Sierra Leone's, which I think is, is a very colonial idea, this idea of Sierra Leone as sort of a, a space in which Britain can intervene and intervenes again and again, and, and the ways in which the colonial past is instrumentalized by both sides when it sort of seems convenient. And, and as you said, like during the Civil War, the, the idea that Sierra Leone used to be our colony was, was, was put forward in order to justify the intervention. But then during the Ebola epidemic, that wasn't the case at all. And I mean, Britain still intervened, but, um, but that, that sort of that argument didn't really, didn't get the Sierra Leone and diaspora um, where, they, where they wanted to be. And finally, yeah, I think, um, I think what's, to me, what's really interesting about black mobilities is, is exactly this, 
this this tension in the middle between I think the very violent mobilities that that often are like a go to um, um, a go to to I guess analytical tool and, and I definitely do that as well but then also the the, the sovereign and and self directed mobilities that um, a lot of the diaspora um, engage in and that I think are quite similar to the back to Africa um, or, or um, mobilities or, or people moving back to Ghana or to Sierra Leone and, and starting up businesses there. So um, yeah, but thank you so much um, for, your, for your thoughts and comments. Thanks, Liba. We've got a couple of questions that have come through in the chat, both um, uh, turning to questions of, uh, of public health, I suppose. Uh, so one from Amber um, asked us to return back to Hackney uh, and asking about, um, have there been any conversations among health policy makers on these uh, racialized effects of, of lockdown and the unevenness of that. Uh, and then Serena's um, also uh, asking about why you think there's this continual return or emphasis on perceived biological differences um, uh, and why that, that is always you know, what seems so often to be uh, um, turned to as an explanation for those sorts of uh, differences as opposed to um, you know, social, economic, political, cultural processes of, uh, of racialization. Thanks. Yeah, um, maybe I'll start with that question. Um, thanks for that. I mean, I think the the short answer is because it's still much easier to talk about and think about um, blackness as, as as biological difference than to um, than to attend to the fact and 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 accept to which extent anti-black racism and racism more generally shapes. The, the public health system in the UK and shapes the way in which people can receive care, shapes the way in which people receive care, the way in which people seek care, the trust that they have in the healthcare system, and the fact that nothing has been done about that for so long. And I think I'm now based at a public health uh, university, and it's, it's, it's really interesting that, I mean, medical sciences, and, and I think that's the, the case for sciences more generally, are always seen as very neutral and as, as, as objectively scientific rather than as a product of a society as a cert, at, at a certain point. And I think, I think people are very, very hesitant to sort of like take medicine off its pedestal, especially at a moment right now where the energy is under so much pressure and doctors and, and healthcare staff are doing so much work to save lives every day, to also accept that racism moves through the healthcare system and through biomedicine and, and, and that biomedicine really historically has been incredibly involved in, in projects of colonialism and enslavement and has benefited from them as well. And I think that's just that's a reality that's really uncomfortable and that that and it's just much easier to say, well it's because these people are different. Um, yeah. Um, have there been um, have there been conversations among health policy makers? Um, not as not 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 a lot. I mean, a little bit, and there have been um, conversations among um, public health people and, and public health researchers in the UK around having to do more research into into the racialized effects of, of lockdown and of COVID nineteen. But um, I don't know if you followed this. It was on Twitter a while ago. Um, 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 the I think the National Institute for Health Research um, advertised a number of of well put out money to, to conduct research into racism and COVID, and they ended up giving uh, no money went to a project that was led by a black person. And again, that created a huge stir. So I think these, these conversations are happening, but they are happening at like a very small scale and are probably still not happening in the way that they should be happening. Thank you. Um, so I, I actually can't see, oh yes, thank you. <laughs> it's just popped up on the um, yeah, actually, and I think this uh, question from uh, Shivangi connects to one of the comments that Patricia made, actually, I think her closing remark around networks of solidarity, and also very, it struck me actually about um, get that notion of emotions and, and joy as well, and that there are different modalities to, to different kinds of solidarity, struggle, resistance as well. Could, could, you, could you speak to a little bit about that? Yeah, so I don't, I don't know much, I don't know much about it, but um, definitely, um, I um, walked past, and I can't remember the name right now, but I, I walked past sort of a, a, a POC bereavement fund poster the other day um, in East London. Um, I think people are mo mobilizing on the local level very much. I know we all have these um, COVID-19 support groups, but um, I think, well, there's a lot to be said about this as well, but um, I think I think people are, are sort of mobilizing and are being emotionally supportive, like in the 
like at a, at a very small scale level. And I think in, in a way that's good because that means that trust remains intact and it allows people to support each other in a way that is not co-opted by, um, by, by maybe the government or by sort of broader discourses around equality and diversity, et cetera. Um, but um, apart from that, I, I'm afraid I don't know a lot about um, solidarity networks, but I'm sure um, there's a lot out there. Sorry, Patricia. Yeah, it's a bit awkward, so I won't turn on my camera, but I just want to comment on the solidarity networks um, in London because my family are in Hackney, obviously, um, or almost, and they, in fact, they've had COVID, so we, you know, we have some, I have some direct um, information, but I think for me, what was, in, what's been interesting is um, the role that the Black churches have played in providing support for the community. Um, and it, it, it really was the church that made a difference from my um, elderly relatives. Uh, you know, people cooked meals and delivered them and so on. So they weren't relying on sort of um, state, you know, function, um, state uh, welfare interventions. They were providing those um, within their own communities. And I, I think there's a lot of that going on. Um, and actually something I, you know, I wanted to study as as well, <laughs> but I, and I did put in an application and didn't get funding, you know, for that. I, mean, I wanted to look at fake, um, yeah, some sort of information and solidarity amongst um, people of color in, um, in in Hackney, in in London, but in Hackney in particular. Uh, but yeah, those solidarities are there. They're they're quite strong, and and I think that's what happens really in. Um, where uh, people experience precarity, where mobility is very tenuous. And, uh, you know, in a lot of the literature on mobility uh, and transnationalism, we've heard not just for black communities that people move into networks and settle um, and use those networks to help build, um, you know, their, 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 their stay within a country. But in fact, those networks never disappear. They're always what people rely on. They might grow in size and sometimes shrink. They're shrinking now because of gentrification and acne, but they're still ever, you know, they're ever present. Thanks, Patricia. Um, so I'm afraid uh, Amber and, and, and Sneha, I'm going to pass responsibility on. I gave me very strict instructions about keeping to time for this event. So I regret to say we've we've finished an hour, an hour, our hour uh, and it, but it's been an incredibly rich hour, and I wish we did have more time. To, to go into more depth around man, many of the issues that you raised, Leo, but thank, thank you so much for such a thought provoking um, uh, talk, uh, both sort of empirically, senses of history, also me methods and theory. I mean, it, it was all there, so that, thank you so much. That was fantastic. Um, thank you to the various uh, people who posed questions. Patricia, thank you for your comments, uh, your commentary. To, to Amber and Sneha for uh, organising uh, the event. Um, thank you for attending. Um, I really appreciate it. Uh, and I look forward to our next all, all, all school seminar, which will be happening at some point uh, next term. Uh, and thank you so much again, Leova. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> all right. Goodbye for now, everybody. Mm -hmm.